welcome to Athenaeum, or Athenium, or however you say it. I'm Rob. I'm Jake. And I'm Sam. Welcome to a conversation about writing, literature, and the culture that feeds them. Okay, what are we talking about today? Add romance tropes. <laughs> and, and I do mean the genre of romance, not just, you know, romance that you see throughout mm -hmm. most literature. Um, yeah. Which actually, Rob and I had an interesting conversation about that and the fact that here, mm. we're going to start out a question before. before. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Keep going, Sam. <laughs> 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 We are going to start out with a question before we get into the tropes of the um, romance novel that I've been semi-forcing the two of you to read, um, which is, can you tell a good story, like a good novel-length story, without any romance? Mm. Oh, let me get rid of my pug quick. <laughs> can you tell a good story without any romance, eh? Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking through them, and you're right, there are are surprisingly few examples. Um, yeah. Let's see. I think all the Marvel movies have some sort of romance in them, so can't find any examples there. Yeah. That I think that at least proves the uh, the what's it called the 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 idea that it's uh, profitable to include romance, even if not mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily required for a good story um, yeah I, the big one i can think of that isn't like a, a child's movie or a folk tale yeah I was just is, about um, to say. <laughs> the the hobbit yeah that's a good example yeah. Yeah. um so i think if if it's not there's no romance in it you still have to have like some kind of friendship or companionship to yeah. some extent for sure, for sure. Like, I guess most of these Sherlock stories are a good example of that as well. They don't have any True. romance. And even the ones that do mention it, it's very, very to the side. Mm -hmm. and unfocused. Um, yeah. It's an interesting point, because I, in my writing, I'm well, pretty intentionally straying away from romance. Partly because it's the main characters are an older man and a younger girl. <laughs> it would be pretty awkward, I think. That's a good... <laughs> it, it would be. It, yeah. it could be a little awkward. Yeah. Uh, a few so, more years and it won't be that weird, but uh, <laughs> she's a little young. Yeah, she's Although... actually fresh out of school. Like, he literally picked her up from school. <laughs> it's like, hey, you're my partner now. So that would be a little strange. <laughs> Actually, okay. So that is a trope, weird trope, but it is a trope that is mm. in. So the the novel that they are reading to c talk about a lot of very common, quote unquote, bad tropes or really overdone tropes, mm. um, is "Burn for Me" by Alona Andrews, mm -hmm. and that actually brings up one of the tropes that "Burn for Me" does do. I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but Burn For Me is one of the ones that does the trope of generally, not always, but quite frequently, the leading man, the love interest in a romance novel is almost, is always, almost always older than the leading girl. Hmm. Well, uh, um, there's some debate about whether that's a fiction uh, trope or if it's a real life trope. So yes. I've heard some about some data that suggests that uh, women, uh, it's not necessarily that women prefer older people and men prefer younger people. It's just more like they dislike the opposite, I think, mm -hmm. from what I've heard. Yeah. Um, mm. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and certain uh, biological realities just make it more likely that that works out that way i think yeah so there's a thing that you you see a lot in um romance novels across the world and honestly it's not a bad trope mm. but it is one that is present in this novel because i believe between 
Rogan and Nevada, there's at least, I think it's at least a four year difference if it's not more like six year difference age yeah, gap. It's, it's interesting though, the way the prologue is written at least, it kind of, mm -hmm. he comes across as if he's like 40 or something. He does. He yeah. really does. And so, yeah, the, the descriptions and this information you've been giving us is kind of like, are you sure? Like, is something going wrong here? Uh, yeah. I think that's uh, one of the many subtle flaws that the book has. <laughs> and I think it's important to say before we trash it too much that a lot of the writing quality, like, word for, like sentence by sentence especially and even some some other aspects are quite good in the book but there are a lot of there are a lot of flaws that we will be talking about mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. yeah this isn't this isn't a this isn't a bad book across the board it yeah. is a published book that a lot of people have read and enjoyed it it just it has a lot of very common themes as well as like character style and um kind of just prose style yep. uh, that, yep. that is common in romance novels particularly paranormal fantasy novels mm. nowadays that um we are going to be discussing that we think it could be done better so <laughs> all right what are we going to start with <laughs> Um, I, I think actually one of the, the ones that I, I wanted to talk about that yeah. I think the two of you both really get um, twitchy <laughs> a little bit about is it seems like there's a, a different metaphor, maybe some of the times it's the same repeating metaphor, every page or every couple of pages. Mm. <laughs> so we uh, have um, yeah. the Rogan is a tire. Rogan is a um, dragon. We yeah. have um, kind of just how she relates, how because this is written in first person, mm. and in this first person you also get all of her um, mental, not just thoughts, but kind of how her brain works. Mm. And apparently this character's brain works all the time in metaphors of this is and similes. This is like this, or it's as if ba 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 ba. And I think that was one of the things that really bothered both of you, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I think I didn't mind it as much as Rob, but I <laughs> I did enjoy clowning on it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> the one that I remember more, if if even if it didn't annoy me as much, was the the every time she talked about well, what's the Pierce, uh, oh, the Pierce, who is described like a love interest, but is more accurately a, like a villain or antagonist almost of the story. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very strange setup. Um, but he uh, every time she talks about him for more than a paragraph she mentions how he's going to he, he could and probably will use his fire powers to destroy her but she uses different baffling metaphors for that every single time like like fat in a pan or uh, there's i there was, there's so many weird ones that i i can't remember them because they're so weird uh, did, I you... just remember Fry. Fry, yes, that was it. Fry was... Oh, uh, oh yeah. Um, I... So hot that her fingers will start peeling off. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Oh, and that's a weird like... one. <laughs> Your skin would peel. Really. E even <laughs> you like okay. So let's go through like if you were in a severe fire, if someone lit you on fire, mm. you don't. You don't. The skin never peels. It eventually flakes, right? Yeah. Like, your skin will bubble and boil and then crisp yeah. up and flake. I think people yeah, are probably sleep. mistaking when you get burnt and then the dead skin peels off afterwards like a sunburn. 
Yeah. That's a very specific phenomenon. Uh. Oh, really? You can think about it just like any other form of meat. I mean, yeah. you're going to start cooking, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you get Look at that steak exposed that's peeling. to a large amount of heat, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, what's really going to happen is the skin will get um, tougher. Mm -hmm. If the heat is a little bit more, I guess you could say, uh, humid, yeah. then, you know, you'll, you'll probably, I, I could see to some degree how the metaphor melt would be apt. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, melt would make more sense than peeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Partially because it's a very common one that's used that... Uh, and I think the melt comes more from you're gonna sweat. You're gonna sweat so much. You, it's gonna look like you're melting. You're gonna feel like you're melting because there's just so much liquid pouring out of you. Oh, yep. Um, yeah. But from a from a, a imagery point of view, I don't think that peeling is quite what she wants to go for. No. And no. especially in that sentence, it. It referred to specifically her fingers peeling, which was very strange because it, it didn't mention her hands in the previous sentence at all. I actually uh, found the... Yeah, yeah the, so... Uh, he had made the containment circle and then filled it with heat. I had my taser in my bag. I could probably shoot him from here, but even if the taser hit him and he went down, getting it anywhere close to him was out of the question. The heat would peel the skin off my fingers. And uh, yeah, it's like, but not the rest of you. It's, uh... yeah. You know, and that's another thing that's uh, with with the metaphors. <laughs> it's just like they often don't really. Um, it's not just so much that they're everywhere. It's also that they're not really like effective, effectively mm. used for what the tone of the scene is supposed to be. Yeah, like with the building. You know that she describes as being a shark fin. I yep. think she means to like, I guess, imply that this this building is filled with like uh, sort of like this danger, like this um, dangerous, predatory, this impending sort of roar that could leap out at you at any time, <laughs> and that going up to the shark fin was an intimidating sort of thing. Hmm. Well, calling the building a shark fin is not only odd. But also, a little silly. Come on. Mm -hmm. You know, you're an adult. Yeah. And you're intimidated by that or, building. Although I think there might be another purpose for th that type of uh, metaphor, which is when there isn't a clear, easy, and memorable name for something. So for, exa for that example, the alternative would be, you know, the the headquarters of... I don't remember any of the characters' names. Like this, this character, or, or this, the department of this thing, and you know that that would be more accurate, but it would be less memorable, less interesting, and longer to write in most cases. So, for, just from well, a writing was, point of view, the shark fin is easier, I think. <laughs> the name was M I I for the company. I, I forget yeah. what it stands for, but it's Montgomery well, something or something. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess that... Um, See, Montgomery Investigative... Yeah, yeah it's like Montgomery Investigative... Something. <laughs> uh, Institution. Uh, I could probably look that up. <laughs> uh, industry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, International investigations. That's what it was. Uh, it was. Yep. Yeah. And you know, to the point of those those metaphors, mm -hmm. that happens all the time. Um, yep. Not just when we're using metaphor, but also when anything is going on, uh, the mm. tone will be defeated by the main character's yeah. Specific actions and her thoughts. I remember we were talking about this specifically in the scene I, I just read a quote from when it's her first face-to-face -face confrontation with this character who's been constantly described as incredibly dangerous and 
someone she needs to interact with in order to, you know, save herself from terrible consequences. Um, and yet, every, like, few paragraphs, there'll be some other reference to how attractive this guy is and how much she likes or dislikes his shirt being off <laughs> and things like this. Yeah. And we we definitely noticed that it entirely killed any pacing, or like, tension in the scene. Um, for us, at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And I think, too, that's what leads to um, Pierce, who is not the love interest, being a red herring of a love interest. <laughs> yeah, right? it's very strange. Because um, the main character doesn't meet the love interest until <laughs> 60 or 90 pages in. Mm. Yeah, it's, I think it's not. Yeah, it's a little bit more. Yeah, I, think I guess it's 90 pages in. I guess we haven't <laughs> specified yet, but me and Rob... Uh, finding it slow going with this book, so we're only up. Uh, we've only just finished chapter five, I think. Which yes, is roughly a hundred pages yeah. out of five hundred. Yeah, so it was ninety pages in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, which which is that's where this book does do an, a non-normal thing of not introducing the love interest right away. So. Um, well, I, I guess we kind of need to know this. It's a bit of a spoiler, but is Rogan the love interest? Spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rogan okay. is the love interest. Well, I'll, I'll give a little point in the favor of the book, which is that he is in the very first chapter, the prologue of the book. Yeah, so. but do you actually know that it's Mad Rogan? Yeah, it... it they mention, they do it, talk about his name? Yeah. Okay. But like I said earlier, it, the impression he gives is of like a 40-year-old bachelor who mm -hmm. is not interested in other people at all and just lives in his mansion like a like a, a character from a horror movie or something. <laughs> yeah, which is another, which ends up being um, quite a false statement in reality. Yeah. Uh, so that does bring us to actually a thing that I didn't like in the book, which was it's a romance novel and we don't meet our main romantic interest until 90 pages into the book. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and the build up to him, honestly, they could have had a confrontation with him way sooner, yeah. way, way sooner. Because if you look at the influence that these people have, he could have known that she was put on the case almost as soon as they decided to do it. Yeah. Even something like a call could have made it less abrupt. You know, mm -hmm. just a very quick call between the characters. Unless... Uh, hmm? And, you know, we should very quickly hmm. say that Sam can say it a little bit better. The premise for the story. Oh, okay. So, so yes, we will... <laughs> Very we'll organized. get into the premise now because this is where it kind of plays in more with how the tropes are used and, and everything else and just how this book plays out. Mm -hmm. So the premise for this novel is that back in the 1800s, you had kind of an, an experiment gone wrong, which left people, certain people around the world with um, superhuman powers, yep. telekinesis, um, mind reading, uh, the ability to control storms and weather, to start fires, um, a whole variety of things. And you kind of have um, levels of power. And so these powerful people then formed houses with their families. To be a house, you have to have a prime and um, is it secondary uh, or I'm a lower level? It. I'm looking for it right now, actually. Um, oh, a significant Significant, yeah. You have to have one prime and two significance to become a house. And the way that this world ended up developing is that all your rich, powerful people, pretty much all of them, are primes. They are part of these houses. As soon as you become a house, you end up with a lot of money and influence. And um, the way that it, the U.S. has worked it out is that when primes have a disagreement... <laughs> They have to sign a big contract, and every house 
for the, again, for the most part, there's a couple lesser houses that don't, but the big major player houses all have their own private military. I don't mean private security. They have their own private military. Mm-hmm. So that's, that is the world that is set up here. Um, and the premise for this particular book is that our main character, Nevada, who is the um, head of her family's investigative services, which uh, they are currently owned by and controlled by MII, uh, have been given a case that MII doesn't want to deal with because they don't think it can be done. And they're forcing the smaller agency to take it on so that if they fail, it's on that agency and not the bigger one. Um, And that case is that she has to go and find a prime who has gone a little rogue from his family. He was involved in bank robbery that, no, he didn't light the bank on fire, (laughs) but he's a prime who lights things on fire all the time. And um, one of the people who was with him, a teenage boy, ended up shooting the security guard. So now they are both wanted as murder suspect. I think he's an accessory to murder, technically. Um, But the family, his family, has hired the investigation services to find him so that they can then take him and deal with it as primes deal with it, which is to say outside of the normal law for us lowly plebs. So Yeah, that was a good summary. Thank yeah. you. And you know, I think in general, I actually uh, like the premise. I yeah. do too. I think the premise is really interesting. I think the idea of um, you have these super powerful people who have come into power because they have power or because they have superpowers and they have money and influence and mm. all of this stuff makes it really interesting. <laughs> um, the only complaint, and well, that and then when they get into fights, you guys, private militaries having fights in the middle of the street, it's mm. a really interesting read. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, it kind of turns, uh, in this case, Houston into almost the third world where you have, you know, two different big gangs going at it and destroying everything in their wake. Mm. Um, <laughs> but but the the downside and i think rob will agree with me is that so this happened in the 1800s right it was it's not a new thing that happened it happened long enough ago that there that the legal system is kind of built up around having to deal with these people who destroy stuff all the time and kind of can take lives and there's nothing they can really do about it but you still have all the same technology the same human the, the same level of development in the human yeah. world side of it. Um, to the point you where, have everything the same. To the point where they specifically refer to things like Twitter. Yes. And it's yeah. rather distracting when, you know, there's just as often <laughs> re- references to magical abilities, you know. Yes. Yeah. In, and Yeah. It, 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 if you don't do a, it, a hidden magical world, that I think that can be quite distracting for the reader. Mm-hmm. And like one of the big things is that when it comes to technology, if you have these people with these superpowers and they're the ones who are in power, I'm guessing, you know, the places that created Facebook wouldn't have the people who would be interested in creating Facebook or Twitter. I think that you would be, um, it would be more accurate to have the technology stuck in the 90s, right? Mm. Um, very usable uh and maybe you know like the map and navigation stuff would be more advanced and things like that but i don't think your social aspect would be because as the powers that be that are technically outnumbered by the plebs Hmm. i don't think they would want the plebs to be able to easily you know ban against them (laughs) cancel culture would not be good for these guys no would not be good i i can't get into the whole like you know I just don't know enough to be able to say exactly what society looks like. But I am 100% sure that whatever people think about, like, large secret societies would basically just come to life. Like, there wouldn't be secrets anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, 
have ever thought that, oh, the real world is actually controlled by, you know, a relative handful of insanely influential and powerful people. Well, imagine if those people had actual power. I mean, they wouldn't need to hide. They wouldn't need to, you know, control things from the shadows because now their their mm. their vulnerability has been taken away. Mm. And certain things I can see, like uh, maybe the right to bear arms, w- would just get you know taken away. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah, that's a You're good point. Say, no, this is my constitutional right to have my, you know, my, my rifle. And then somebody's going to show up at your house and explode it. <laughs> yep. And you can't do anything about it because that's your government now. I mean, there, there might not be as, as confrontational as all that. But certainly I don't think everything would just be the same, except we also have people with power. Yeah, it's a good point. A lot of the specific ways that countries like America exist now were heavily influenced by that period that they are saying this magic was so prominent in. So, uh, yeah, it's very doubtful that things would be the same. Oh, yeah. In fact, if this was in the 1800s, which I I maybe that slips from my mind, Mm -hmm. there's a lot that happened. In between the 1800s and today, or you know, when this book was written, to be yeah. a little bit more accurate, uh, you had both world wars. We, in fact, you may as well just say that we had all, all the wars, uh, because <laughs> just about all the wars that have made a difference in what the world looks like today, with the exception of like the American Revolution. I or, and the civil, I think the Civil War also took place before this would have happened. All the historical okay, wars. That was in like the 1800s, though. Mongols and stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not, I'm going to say in, for America, because yeah. the story takes place in America and it references a lot yeah. of American things. Obviously, I, I other actually, things have happened I, across the world in different ways. Well, and I, I don't. I don't know how much there are super people, you know, magical people outside of the U.S. Because I think the experiment that went wrong happened in the U.S. Yeah. I, um, no, it says European scientists discovered it. Oh, and J.K. To, Never mind. To confuse it even more, it's called the Osiris serum. Kind of implying it has some connection to Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Ignore what I just said then. (laughs) Well, my point that the story takes place in America is at some point, this serum came to America, Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, either in serum form or in in somebody's person. And uh, if you if you have everything else be the same, except for people with powers, you know, Sam and I were discussing this last night. It's like that's really just almost like a waste of of your magical world because you have no desire for for me at least to explore this world and what it's like and everything is now relying on your characters and their interactions because i don't typically wonder you know what would this world look like if i could just burn alive you know my enemies or you know instead of having to pay my school debt, I could just say no. And they'll be like, well, you have lightning power, so I guess you don't owe us any more money. Right, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not really, <laughs> it doesn't really make for good story material. You know, you could daydream about it all you want, but for the sense of your setting, which kind of everything about your story will rely on, including your characters, mm. it's just a little drab, you know? Yep. That that does lead perfectly into the next trope that is common in romance that this book definitely does, which is our characters, particularly our main character, having very odd, unrealistic reactions to situations. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> she, the one I remember is that 
uh, when she met the Adam Pierce, the antagonist character, she decided to only speak the truth uh, uh, about exactly what her situation was, including the fact that she was hired to like bring him in and that kind of thing. And uh, we 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 both uh, had the thought that that might not be the best idea it, for somebody in that situation. And especially since the character's magical ability is to tell when somebody's lying, it seems mm -hmm. like ironic almost that she's decided not to do it ever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the other thing that this book kind of suffers from, if we use that term, <laughs> is some of the odd reactions would make sense if there was more logic behind the why. Like um, hmm. her interactions with Pierce, right? If she went that route based on what she knew about him and how he interacted yes. with people, or her previous interactions with people like him and the fact that, well, you know, here we go. We're going to have to tell the truth again because if he catches me lying, then he'll burn me. Or <laughs> instead of it's, well, he could burn me, so ah, we'll just go all in. And we'll yeah. just go be be a sassy character to be a sassy character. But there's, there's yeah. literally no indication or information before she meets him that he has anything against lying or that he's a terrible flirt other than the fact that he's shirtless in a picture she has of him. Um, <laughs> there's like a lot of assumptions that she makes that happen to be right um, that, that turn out in her favor in that scene. Yes. Um, On top of I... the fact that her assumption that he would burn her just on sight, I guess. Yeah. yeah, didn't happen either. Like, there's there's a long section <laughs> about her million dollars of insurance money or life insurance uh, yeah. that so, she hopes will go to her family if she dies. <laughs> so even her fears seem a little unfounded for one, but also she just forgets them. Yes, she gets in the moment, mm -hmm. and she's pretty brave for someone who is. Uh, moments ago thinking that this was about to be the end of her life and that happens a couple times throughout the story that that we've read so far yeah oh don't worry it keeps happening <laughs> oh, good, good. i was afraid that it would go away oh well, and then you have when she's being tortured right and she's handling this torture quite well so that not only is she getting sassy you know one-liners out which if you're being tortured yeah i could i could get that um but not an entire you know speech in the middle of being tortured <laughs> I, yeah yeah <laughs> um do you guys want me to read the uh her monologue about how her family's love is unconditional for her Oh yes, please. <laughs> so remind us. So she's she's reflecting on the fact that uh, that Pierce has been disowned by his family to some extent, and so she says, "All my life, I knew that my parents loved me unconditionally. Oh, they let me suffer the consequences of my mistakes, but they always loved me. I could go on a wild shooting spree and murder a dozen people, and my mother and my grandmother would be horrified." but they would fight for me to the bitter end. They would be confounded, but they would still love me and give me the best attorney and cry when I would go to the sacrificial chair. <laughs> if my father was still had still been alive, he would have done the same. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Heroic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some downright gallant behavior right there. I know, right? It's, uh, it's a very poetic way to explain just how much your family loves you. <laughs> literally, a very, very inane way. Why are you, why is our main character having these thoughts? That's my yes. question. Yes. Why is it even on our main character's mind that she could <clears throat> kill a bunch of people and still be loved? 
is that how, is that what our main character thinks about? Like, is that what she values? <laughs> how about you know just saying how much her parents love her through something she's actually done or something yeah. they've actually shown, yeah. as opposed to these wild and hypothetical, uh, you know, fancies of the mind. I, I, you know, it's just not, it's unsettling to think that our main character, who we're supposed to be following, who we're s presumably supposed to care about a little bit. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, should I bring up the real world example? Yeah. Where some, some prominent figure who ideally a lot of people should like talked about how he could kill a bunch of people and still be <laughs> supported. <laughs> Perhaps not. Perhaps not. I think oh, a segue I was going to make was through the fact that the main character is very kind of bland and unlikable to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, part of me wonders though whether, like, if if this is a good example of uh, needing a really good opening for your character to to make them sympathetic to, to you. Um, I have a few examples, but they're from Sanderson books, so maybe you guys could try and come up with better ones. <laughs> so I don't spoil it for uh, you. Of opening? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe maybe I'm not, not doing, not being very clear right now. So, uh, I was just going to quickly jump back to the to the introduction for this character and kind of see what that's like. So first, the first thing that we see is all men are liars, all women are liars too. I learned that fact when I was two years old, and my grandmother told me that if I was a good girl and sat still, the shot the doctor was about to give me wouldn't hurt. It was the first time my young brain connected the unsettling feeling of my magic tone detecting a liar to the actions of other people. So... It's it's actually a decent introduction for characterization, I would say. Kind of mm -hmm. gets across this cynicism and her magical ability and this tendency to reflect on strange things at strange times. But <laughs> cynicism is not a trait that we find relatable or interesting in our main characters. Uh, well, it can be, but... We prefer either a mysterious reason or a much stronger, more interesting reason than... People I, lie. Yeah, I noticed that people <laughs> lie a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Huh? I, I just thought it might be interesting if we could think of some openings to characters and try to talk about... So, uh, one opening that comes to my mind hmm. is... Um, the Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Yep. Top and, of my um, TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the, when that character is introduced, it is also being told... I think it is third person. But it's being told at first from the perspective of someone else. Mm. And we meet him as a bartender, a barkeep, who yep. is very precisely cleaning his bar and this guy is coming in and bothering him about his past. And he's just like, ah, I'm not that person anymore. Hmm. But I'll tell you the story of how I became the person I am today. Hmm. And that involves the person that I was. Right. Um, so I, and, I haven't read it, but I imagine the draw in that opening is the mystery. You wanted to yeah. find out why this character is like this. Mm -hmm. Um. Trying to mentally go, oh, actually, okay, you know what? I can use another romance book. They actually did a great job introducing yep. one of our main characters. It just didn't really pay off for me very well. Yeah. But um, this novel, which I'm not going to name because it, it, it was okay, and I don't really want to bad, bad mouth that <laughs> particular author too much. Um but it opens with you have this guy who turns out is a werewolf, part of a werewolf pack, mm. who um, there's a knocking on the door and someone goes to answer it and they come back and they say, your granddaughters are here. 
without their mother. And he's like, oh no, immediately. He knows that the mother has died because there's no way that these three young girls would be here without their mother. Like, no way. Um, so he goes to the door, and yep, their mother has died. And um, how we actually get introduced to these three girls who end up being main characters and the oldest being the main character um, is that he tells them that, you know, their current alpha of this pack is going to give them grief because only one is part werewolf. The other two share the same father, who is a honey badger, but have different mothers than his granddaughter. And so the alpha comes and he's like, I, I need to talk to these three by myself. And then the how they're introduced is again in the third person. It turns out there is a teenage girl up in a tree um, next to where this conversation is happening. And how they introduce these three girls is, oh, they're very sweet. They're talking very kindly to him. But then the three girls end up scheming against him. They have the youngest go sit right next to him. The oldest is standing there talking. And the middle one wanders away and comes back. And when he finally like gives his threat of, well, only the one who's part werewolf can stay, the third girl, who has this big rock, takes the rock smashes it against the oldest sister's face so she gets knocked down then turns and at this point the werewolf is freaking out like what why did you just hit your sister with a rock she's bleeding and she turns and she takes the same bloody rock that's got her sister's blood on it now and turns it and smashes it against his hand on his knuckles so it looks like he punched the eldest girl well <laughs> And then here comes the youngest daughter's play in this mm. is she starts. So there's a, a good solid pause where the three girls are looking at him and he's looking at them and he's like, what's going on? And suddenly the youngest starts crying and screaming and the oldest is crying and the middle one's crying and uh, he hit her, he punched her, he made her bleed and he disappears after that. They never speak of that alpha again. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's a really good way to set up your characters. Of they are ruthless mm. when it comes to making sure that they themselves are safe. Yeah, yeah. And they're not afraid to take other people out for that. So very unique characters, and on top of that, quite driven, incompetent, and intelligent. So, mm, uh, even from a young age. Yeah, it's a very interesting way to do it. Uh, another yeah. example. Also, yeah, you want to go first? No, no, no. I was commenting on the. Uh, <laughs> go on. Uh, the the those particular characters. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, said they were villainous. Oh, villainous. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, another example that everyone should know is uh, Harry Potter. Because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why why the uh, accent hey, ahead, anyway uh, the the point is that in Harry Potter the the character is set up and placed into the the pro possibly like the worst one of the worst first world <laughs> experiences you can have as a, as a child you know in a in a family that hates you you given the scraps you sent to the worst school you're you you live underneath the stairs in a cupboard, you know, and uh, and so this is this is the one of the best examples of a relatable opening, where the you you kind of understand the character and sympathize with them, uh, especially for the target demographic of high school students. Oh. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh no. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, uh, so I, I think Harry Potter is a good example of a very good opening to a character that possibly does a lot of the work of making us find them interesting and relatable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and like the idea of her being a lie detector is interesting. Mm. Um, in burn for me, but <laughs> burn for me. 
Uh, <laughs> but I think they, I think it just isn't utilized to a full enough extent. It does get That's... used a lot more in the following books. Right. Yeah. But That's something I've definitely noticed is, uh, it's it's not it's never brought up in her family it's never mentioned as like something that annoys her or that she uses to her advantage it's just kind of a thing that almost seems to be added afterwards you know when somebody's mm -hmm. lying because it it doesn't even factor into the plot she never uses the information she gets really there's always an another way that she could have got that information yeah. so far at least mm -hmm. It it does play in later on. Um, mm. It ends up it ends up playing a pretty good role in the overarching story between the three books. Right. Um, but but yeah, it's early in in this book. It's not quite as much of a thing. Yeah. Um, I, ironically, the the most useful it's been so far is. Uh, it it happens to be in the right category of magic to deflect uh, a psychic attack mm -hmm. <laughs> which is it's kind of ridiculous for such a specific and potentially useful ability <laughs> but that's the first yeah. time it's been used properly yeah I, and i think it's one where okay so you have all of this power that you're mm. trying so hard to hide i think honestly you would need to know how to utilize it to properly hide it especially if you can torture someone Mm. Um, and there, are, there are other skills that can go with this as well, um, including, if I remember correctly, this is this is so far ahead in the books. You guys aren't going to read past this first one. Um, if you do, I would be very surprised. <laughs> um, but it turns out that this particular skill that she has, she can actually force someone to never talk about something again, or she can take their memories. Wow. She can wipe them. Yeah. That's... As an investigator, that's super useful. Yes. And as someone trying to hide what she is and how powerful she is, it's really useful to know. Yeah. Almost convenient, I would say. <laughs> yes. Very convenient. Uh. Very convenient. <laughs> At least it's, it's more related and relevant than some conveniences are in plots, so... I wouldn't judge it too early. <laughs> well, yeah, I, this is the kind of story where I don't think the point of this story is like, let's grow our magic and let's become stronger so that we can mm. you know, come back evil or do whatever it is we have to do. Yeah. It seems much more just like, these are the tools that I have and I'm just going to go out there and try and make it. And then, you know. Maybe well, at some point or another, I'll find out about another power. Most, like, oh, more specifically, it seems that it's very refined as a as a romance story, you know, with the frequency of descriptions of male characters and things like that. <laughs> do you ever get? Because I, it, it's not a a thing I really notice. But do you ever get much of a description of like her or any of the females? No, it's because I remember that. Rob was surprised that she's Mexican in like halfway through chapter three or something. Oh, yep. And that's only yeah. mentioned in passing, not not as an actual description of her. You kind of have to intuit that that is referring to her. It's uh, well, it's we very get, strange. We find out that she has blonde hair and yeah, oh, yeah, there is that and some other stuff. Yeah, this happens like shortly after uh, that call with. Uh, Montgomery and mm -hmm. Pierce's brother in which the mother also gets brought into the call and she says something like uh, uh, I won't even say it just because you know but she says something um, derogatory towards yep. uh, immigrants and you know Nevada takes uh, offense at that <laughs> <laughs> to the point that she now has to ruminate on herself and we get a description of what she looks like. Ah, uh, yes. No, I... <laughs> I, the, didn't, I didn't know that we were going to be talking about this. The other more specific description comes during the scene with Adam Pierce, and it's one of the examples of 
a strange tangent that kind of destroys the tension. Yeah. Because he, he, uh, he makes a reference to the meaning of her name, which is Nevada. Uh, apparently, it means snow covered in Spanish. Um, but then, as soon as after after that line, there's a whole uh, four paragraphs, roughly, of her describing her heritage and what that means for her appearance, and uh, you know, <laughs> giving giving her thoughts on if she likes that or not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where that's a thing that I've noticed is common in a lot of romance is that they get into tangents because they it's almost like you can't find a good way to break that in, but you have to bring it in because you know you have to know what people look like, and um. Well, that's something and, we could discuss another day, perhaps, because I, I yeah. believe you don't need to at all. No, I. I, I get it for a romance. You want to at yeah. least build up enough of a description so that they have an idea or they can build their own. Yeah. I don't think you need a detailed thing most of the time. Yeah. Um, I think there's a novel series, which maybe I can get you guys to read someday. Um, it's <laughs> oh. the Graveyard Queen series by... Mm. Let me check the author quick. But it, it, I like that one because they do get into descriptions of people and of like clothing and stuff, but it makes sense and it works mm. for the story. Um, and that's because she, her profession is she goes and she restores um, graveyards, really old graveyards, particularly in the deep south. Mm. And uh, so they describe kind of the clothing she wears because she's going to get dirty. There could be spiders. There could be snakes. There could yep. be da, 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 da. And when people come and meet her or, like, you know, are looking for her and find her in the um, graveyard, these very, again, very old, very generally poorly maintained graveyards, she comes in to restore or plot or whatever the yep. um, graves. And you then you get a description of the stark difference between what she's wearing. And I think at one point there's a detective looking for her and he shows up and he's got, you know, these shined up shoes. He's in dress slacks. He's got a trench coat yep. and it's like 90 some degrees out and humid and she's in a tank top and these mm-hmm. work pants and these dirty muddy shoes and she's got mud all over her. And yeah, that's, that's where I think it benefits and you can really work in that description yes. really well. Yeah, description that aids character, I think, is really useful. But mm-hmm. just uh, like a few paragraphs in the middle of a tense scene of a very specific, like, uh, personal details, like your hair color. Yeah, I, I don't think yeah. that's ever a good idea. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, ooh, another thing. <laughs> so you guys now know that Mad Rogan is the love interest. Mm. This bothers me a lot. Yeah. And I like Mad Rogan as a character. <laughs> um, I think he's a very interesting character. I think he's actually better written in a lot of ways than Nevada. Um, yeah. but, 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 um, <laughs> he tortures her. He does. Right? First he tortures scene. her. First thing he meets the character, he kidnaps her and tortures her, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, on, from his point of view, uh, the, the torture makes sense given the fact that he has a very military background. He runs a private military. Mm. He was in the military for years and years and did gore, guerrilla warfare. I think he... he am... Oh, no. I'm debating if I'm going to spoil a thing for you or not. Yeah. I will I will resist the spoiler. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I think you learn about it in this book and it makes his actions make more sense. Um, but he had a lot of stuff happen that makes that makes sense to him mm. and makes sense for his character. And he doesn't forgive himself for it. it. It's very much a well after the fact he realizes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But the reason he likes her 
and admires her as an individual is the fact that, like a good soldier, she had her. <laughs> she didn't give in. She she not only withstood the torture, but she figured out a way where she could give him a different secret than what he wanted and still break the magic that was on her. Yeah. And so it makes sense for him to admire her. Um it doesn't make sense for her to be okay with him. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> like, and and honestly, um it doesn't even make sense for her to be like sassy towards him. <laughs> like honestly, someone tortures you unless you have a really really desperate reason to go ask for their help. I don't think you'd avoid them. Like yeah. pretty pretty <laughs> solid avoidance tactic. Um or 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 uh it, if he is really interested in her that way. And, um, from the get-go, he would be apologizing yeah. <laughs> immediately. Like, mm -hmm. um, once he realized that he was wrong, she was not a bad person, she didn't deserve this, it should be a lot of apologizing. Do you think and that would a fit lot with of... his character, though? Hmm? What, do you think that would fit with his character? I was asking. Apologize. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, I think he does end up apologizing quite frequently, but it's still just the overall reaction of I don't I don't think he, the rate at which she ends up being like, ooh, he's so cute, and ooh, I like him even though he tortured me, doesn't uh, make. I think that'd be something that would take years, like years of steadily proving that it was a mistake he didn't mm. he didn't he didn't realize what he was doing like yeah. years not just then, a couple of days yeah, how would you even like get into that position like like you said you know she would she ought to be avoiding this person now i have a read up to what you know the scene that you're referencing but it doesn't make sense to me at all that these people will have another interaction in which it's like, you know, you're not so bad. Mm -hmm. And I, actually, I kind of like you. Hey, you want to go get dinner or something? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm free. If you're free, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> but no. can we talk about how this whole, this whole scene, or um, not this whole scene, this whole, um, sort of occurrence is presented because I thought that that was strange from the start to where yeah. she describes him walking into this, I guess it's like a public park that's attached to uh, the, uh, a public garden. And um, there was just a lot of focus on the cords of his muscle. You know, they use that term a bit. And, and for no reason at all, she feels this sense of danger, despite, you know, like everybody else just, oh, he's hot, given those kind of reactions. Mm -hmm. And then she starts running away for no reason. Yeah. And it's not until she has already felt this, you know, uh, paranoia that the paranoia, it proves justified. And I just thought that this whole thing was a little poorly done because there's no, there's no reason for it to happen. It just seemed like, I guess, convenient for the story, not so much for the character. But. Well, and if I if I remember correctly, in that scene, there's a group of girls who are like eyeing Mad Rogan and like yeah. trying to do a come hither and get his attention, and they're yeah. failing. And you have yeah. yeah, you have this guy walk out. I think he's an all black, or at least he has like dark jeans and biker boots and black shirt on and you see that and you see his behavior that I think that would have worked out a little bit better for it but also he talks about and he even brings it up in the torture session of why didn't you shoot me 
and she's carrying a 22. <laughs> I get not wanting to shoot into a crowd, and she goes on a little spiel about that, which, quite frankly, doesn't make sense for the torture either. Of, no. why didn't you shoot me? I didn't want to shoot anyone. I didn't want to accidentally miss. Like, I didn't want to miss. That's all the answer needed to be. Was, yeah. I didn't want to miss. She, she didn't need to go into a whole spiel. <laughs> Nor did she need to go into a spiel about why why do you carry a twenty two? Well, because then it'll get in there and it won't come out and it'll knock around in the bones and yeah, it, it can it's happen with specific the, and weird. It was it was <laughs> it was really specific. It wasn't very accurate because you have to be a good shot or get lucky for that to happen. And if you wanna if you want a gun that you want to stop someone you don't necessarily want to kill them you're going to go for a larger caliber and then you're going to aim for a leg or a foot or an extremity because that larger caliber you have a better chance of hitting that right yeah and stopping them but uh, her whole reaction to him like what what would have maybe made more sense is I think they they tried to do this was so you have the, the girls who are admiring him right and then have her notice him as well and be like okay you know yeah that's that's looks like the kind of guy who I could never get and would fit perfectly with those girls mm. and then um have it be more of he gets a lot closer to her before she takes off yes it's uh, the 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 thing that tips her off is that he ignores the other women, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not sure. Well, I actually, and the fact that he's looking at her, or, which I guess is a little bit more of a problem. But uh, but, but yeah, like, I don't think she's tough. an ugly girl. I don't think it <laughs> it's unreasonable You'd hope not for, for him to be looking at her. <laughs> yeah, it, it would. It would uh, make more sense for him to get closer and then for him to say something to her and her to be like, oh, no, and, and sprint. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Are you Nevada Baylor? Yeah. She's like, uh, yeah. Finally, I found you or some shit like that. <laughs> then, yeah. But. Yeah. I don't know. Or, the way it was done or, was poor. Were you just. Yeah. Or, or. Um, were you just talking to Adam Pierce? Were you looking for Adam Pierce? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that, that was another thing I noticed at the time is this was very strange in terms of pacing because we we just had the most intense, well, should have been the most intense moment in the book like a few pages ago. And there was like uh, one or two pages to calm down and do some really weird tangent tangential descriptions and then she gets kidnapped and uh <laughs> it was especially since the rest of the story has had so so much time between anything interesting happen like there's one scene where she drives to the the place where the witness was last seen or something and then decides not to go in and ask questions because it's late and most of them would be drunk. So she then drives home again, talks to her brother and grandma for a little bit, and then drives back out again. So, like, there's this really slow, methodical pacing to the the rest of the story. And then we get one giant spike, and another enormous spike directly after that, which is a very interesting choice, in my opinion. (laughs) Um. Yeah, I I have the the passage okay. if you want. Yeah. So, approaching this from a writing point of view, mm. you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about our general feelings on the subject. What do you guys feel like is well, um, well done in this story? I actually like Mad Rogan as a character a lot. Um, I think he himself is a very interesting character who ends up being dynamic and has a very interesting reach of power. 
um, as well as his powers himself. Uh, I also think the relationships between the fam- Nevada's family members, especially yep. um, her and her older cousin, or her and her the eldest boy cousin, mm-hmm. um, are really well done. I, I don't think we get enough of it. <laughs> enough of those relationships, really. From the bit oh, I've oh. read, I would honestly say the trend is that it's all actually quite decent writing, except occasionally there's like a really big noticeable mistake or odd choice. Um, because like there's there's very few grammar mistakes. All the all the sentences are easy to read and understand for the most part. You know, the descriptions are good, except that there's sometimes really weird metaphors and they're put like they're, they're put in a weird place. So they seem like tangents that break the tension. You know, mm-hmm. the, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of the relationships between the characters is quite good and and, uh, and often very realistic. But then mm-hmm. sometimes uh, she just behaves in very strange ways and kind of breaks her realism. And I think it's a good example of the fact that we remember the worst parts about something when when they exist. Like we 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 can't judge something by the average or by the best in most cases. We we judge it by the weakest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, it's I mean it's it is by no means a a poorly written book. It's more just. No. It's. It, I picked this book because I think it has a good. It does a good job of um, making it obvious the typical tropes and methodologies that are used in romance novels that aren't aren't always handled very well and kind of will I think put off readers other than the fact that it's a romance, which this is not a steamy romance. Okay, we're a hundred pages in. Nothing like that has happened. I mean, Ed Rogan <laughs> does recommend she take her bra off at one point. That's true, but <laughs> she doesn't do it. No. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> but, um, that was a little odd too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, but yeah, I, no, I interrupted you, Sam. Though, so, but um, but that's why I picked this one. There are other ones that you do see this as well, but honestly, the rest of the story overshadows them, and they're just little annoyances. Yep. I think this is one that just really captures all the things that will put people off from the genre that have nothing to do with being poorly written or anything like that, or being too steamy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have to do with the actual writing or the actual things that are in it. In the story, mm-hmm. yes. I would agree. Um, well, so, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say we've been going for an hour uh, unless there's something you want, else you want to talk about. It might be a good time to start wrapping it up. Uh, well, I was going to say that there are a number of tangents that happen in the story. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed is that they are wholly unnecessary, but also well enough written that they do come back to whatever caused Nevada to start thinking about them in the first place. Yeah. So when, uh, when she, she hears that, uh, phrasing, that uh, Pierce's mother uses, which, you know, insults her uh, indirectly, sort of. Mm. She starts thinking about, like, some random experience that she had when she was a kid. <laughs> and then uh, that that leads her to start talking about how the way that she looks, uh, you know, how she feels about it. And then all of, eventually it circles back into this is why that phrasing made her think of, you know, the past three paragraphs. Yeah. So th- there is that evidence there that this person, um, or this team, I guess I should say, since they are a team, um, Alana Andrews, I mean, mm-hmm. they are 
understanding what they're doing. You know, they're not total amateurs. Uh, they're not amateurs at all, actually. They're professional writers. Mm. But, but they have a new, I believe it's a New York Times bestselling series in uh, Kate Daniels. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the writing as a whole is not bad. You know, it, it's not terrible. Uh, and what really stands out to me is just the fact that so much of it feels unnecessary that you almost um, don't notice or maybe don't care that the writing is decent because it's just like you're reading so much that feels like, well, why am I actually reading this? Yeah. Where's the story, you know? Um, I, I do think, to, and maybe we can end on this note um i think part of the reason why those descriptions and those metaphors and everything is in there comes from the fact that their main series which is the kate daniel series um the world it's set in is our world that has basically magic there's a magic realm if you would in our world that are touching and you go back and forth between if the magic's in power the technology is in power and um, when the magic is in power, those things are so odd compared to when the technology is in power, they end up needing those descriptions and those comparisons in order to get across what is going on. Yep. Um, it's not a thing that's really needed all the time in this book. Okay. I think it, it ended up being kind of a characteristic thing that in their writing that came up that bled into this one, which isn't an excuse at all, <laughs> no. but yeah. there, there might be people who enjoyed that in that series and they're like, yes, let's get more of it. And, and they probably love it in this book, but it, yeah, I don't, I think we all agree. We don't think it really fits with what they're trying to do. Yeah. That's uh... yeah. The other point is that perhaps a lot of these tropes that we complain about are just what people who read fantasy, uh, these type of romance books like. If especially sure if this writer is successful. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. I was gonna say, do you want to do the uh, the not the outro, or <laughs> should I do? Uh, we don't have a very <laughs> defined one, do we? So whoever can do oh, it. Oh, no. <laughs> Please. Thanks for listening with us for the last uh, hour 15. Does that sound right? Uh, yep. Sounds about. Uh, uh, subscribe, leave a comment, review, ring the bell, do all the things. Uh, we are slowly working on getting onto SoundCloud and some more podcast places. Yeah. But share with your friends. Uh, like I said, leave a comment, subscribe, do <laughs> all the things. Do them um. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, fun talking. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.